So welcome to today's Mixed Media Art Postcard Tutorial and let's get started. So today we'll run through why we started with postcard art. We'll talk through the series of steps that we need to achieve these postcards and then we'll talk about our fourth birthday fun and surprises. So why postcard art? It may seem like a strange thing to start with for a fourth birthday celebrations. But when I sat down to consider what we wanted to do in this online tutorial, I wanted to ensure that we had a project that could include a variety of techniques. So if for some reason you had some of the tools or materials we used and not others, that was fine. You still have the ability to combine them in any way you want to still produce some really fun artwork. The second thing I wanted was something that was easy to share so that we can make them and post them to each other around the globe and use that as an opportunity to reach out and let people see other people's work in real life. Because there certainly is no substitute for seeing something in real life that pictures and, and online tutorials just can't cover. The other thing to consider about postcards is that once we've got our base background done, you don't need to turn it into a postcard. You could cut it to a different size and use it as a bookmark. You could turn it into artist trading cards or ATCs. Or you can turn it into book covers. There's absolutely no limit to the things that you can do once you've got that background and some of those basic techniques under control. So that's why we're looking at postcard art today. Now with any good mixedmediaart.net tutorial, here's our list of materials and tools that we'll need to get started on this project. There will be a detailed list on the website in the next couple of days once we get the videos up. But the key to this technique, to these postcards that we're creating, is of course our good old cereal boxes. Now hopefully by now you've all been collecting them. I'm lucky, I've got two sons that are eating us out of house and home at the moment. So we're going through the really large size cereal boxes. And that's a great way to collect a whole heap of material that we're not afraid to use. And that's the key with our mixedmediaart.net techniques was we want something that you don't think so precious that you're too worried about using it or wasting it. It's just cereal box cardboard. If we're not happy with it, we can throw it up, we can chuck it in the compost and then get another one and start again. Because the more that we envy other people's work, the more that we get trapped in that, oh, I don't know where to start, I don't know where to begin. But as our rational mind all knows, if we don't actually start, if we don't develop our techniques, then we're not going to get any better. So we need to just jump in there and start, try a few different things and just think, well, what's the worst that could happen? And really, if it's that you've ended up with some glitter on your face and some red ink on your fingers, well, that's not so bad, is it? So as well as the cereal boxes, we also need some gesso. We want a couple of colours of acrylic paint and here I've mostly used two to three colours and then some metallic paint as well. We're going to use some spray varnish to make sure we can seal our postcards so as we send them around the world they're a little bit hardier, a little bit more robust. And I've also had some fun with some embossing powders and inks. Now the tools we need are also the basics that hopefully you've all got by now. So we've got some paint brushes and again they don't need to be the expensive ones to get started just go down and buy a set for a few dollars and then expand on that. Do you like using the finer ones? Do you like using the thicker ones? Usually if you give them a good wash and make sure you flick out all the bristles, then even the cheap ones really aren't a problem for getting us started. We're not creating our masterpieces just yet. We also need an old credit card or a store card or just a nice firm piece of plastic to help us spread the paint around. A usual collection of stamps and found objects, some stencils, and this time I've also used a heat gun because I was in a little bit of a hurry. And also some paint markers and we'll talk about exactly which ones I've used as we go along. So what I've done today is create a series of postcards but using three different techniques. Now as we go through you'll easily see that these techniques can actually be combined but what I wanted to do was keep it nice and simple for you so that when you're starting out sometimes it's hard to pinpoint exactly how the, the artist has put their work together. So I want to keep the techniques nice and simple, keep them separate, and then there's no reason at all why you couldn't throw them together later to see what you can create. So with the three main pieces that we used, we've then got three main steps. Firstly, it's to create that base background, so it's to get some colour onto that cardboard. We're then going to embellish that background, and then we're going to cut them up and finalise the details of them and decorate them, which of course is the fun part. So let's get started. So the first thing we need to do is to cut out our cardboard panels. So I just use some nice sharp scissors and not too worried about how straight the edges are. These panels are such a great size that we can usually get some off cuts out of it so we don't need to be too worried about how straight the edges are. 
when I first started, I'd also save the side panels, but now I've realised I've got more than enough cardboard boxes to last me certainly in the next couple of years, if not the rest of my lifetime. So we don't need to save the flaps or the edges. They can go into the recycling and that leaves us a nice big panel to get started with. Now the cereal boxes in Australia have got a nice craft finish to the back. I also did notice when I was in Europe that some of their cereal boxes have beautiful white finishes. Unfortunately, I don't have any of those because my husband wouldn't let me bring them back from our trip to Europe. But if you have those cereal boxes that have the nice smooth panels or backing, then fantastic. But if you've got the ones with the, the card or the craft finish, that's fine too. Okay, our first step, as I'm sure you will have guessed, is that we want to add a layer of gesso. Now, gesso is a universal background that has a little bit of um, grit to it, has a little bit of thickness to it. And what that allows us to do is firstly to cover up the start of this background, even though you can still see the rice bubbles shining through. And also because the cereal boxes tend to have a bit of a gloss finish, this allows us to then add subsequent layers and helps the paint to stick. If you are just starting out, there's not many products that I'd recommend that you really do go out and buy. And gesso can be a little bit expensive when you're just getting started. So I'd suggest go and buy the smallest container that you can find and give it a try. See what we can do with it. There's a variety of techniques on mixedmediaart.net of things that we can do with gesso. So as well as creating backgrounds, we can also do some great resistance techniques and masks, using it as a wash, all sorts of things. So if you don't have any gesso, I would suggest that you see if you can buy some at your next opportunity. Now here I've actually laid it on quite quickly, so I'd certainly suggest when you're ready to throw your postcards together, you might want to put down your layer of gesso and then either leave it overnight or perhaps even do it and then go do something else because otherwise you'll be very patient waiting for it to dry and then wondering why nothing else is sticking to it because it's still coming off. So give us a nice thick layer to get started and here you can see I've swished the brush backwards and forwards to create some nice lines and that texture also comes through as we add the different dimensions to our postcards. So now we're ready to add some colour, so let's get started. So once our background's dry, we can then add some colour. Now the first method I want to talk you through is jelly plate printing. Now I realise that not all of you will have a jelly plate. What I wanted to do was just use it as one of the techniques to show you some of the things you can do with it. So if you are umming and ahhing about purchasing one, I'd certainly suggest you do. I will warn you though that once you have it, it is quite addictive and I now have a pile nearly two inches thick of jelly plate printed backgrounds that I'm actually not sure what I'm going to do with yet. So I'm not allowed to do any more jelly plate printing until I found a use for all the backgrounds. Maybe we'll have to start up a swap. So to get started for the jelly plate printing, I've grabbed two colours, a light green and a dark green, something to add texture with. And here I've used some sequin scrap that's being sold in our local um, Merchant Ma Manchester store. It's actually been sold as floral ribbon, so it's only a couple of dollars a roll and we can get quite a bit out of it for our own projects. And then what we do is with all the jelly plates, and hopefully you've been watching the tutorials on mixedmediaart.net, so we just put down a small dob of paint, roll it out, and then we can add our texture onto it and then press our cardboard on. Now in this case, I've taken that background piece of cardboard and cut it in half so that it will fit onto the jelly plate. The problem with this, of course, is then you tend to get paint on your hand from around the edges, but that's okay. That's all part of the fun. So for the first couple of layers, I used the two greens, and then as we move forward, I added a little bit of white in as well. Because we all know that just one colour is boring, so we just want to add something else in to add some interest, to add some texture. And there are our finished finished jelly plate background. So you can see there's some lines, some shapes, there's some light bits, some dark bits, some bit of background throwing through. So we'll leave that one to dry and move on to our second technique. So our second way of creating our base background is to use our credit card painting. Now if you haven't had a go at this, please, please give it a try because it is so much fun and again it's a quick and easy way to create colourful backgrounds and because the paint's so thin it actually dries really quickly as well. So it makes it so much easier to create a whole heap of backgrounds and then get them ready so you're not worrying about adding that colour and getting started. So here I've used a dark green, a light green and again that metallic highlight. 
So to do the credit card painting, we squirt some across the top of the paint. We take our credit card or our store card and use that to scrape the paint around. And again, I'll have a video of that on the website in the next couple of days so you can see that technique. Once the base layer is dry, we're then ready to add that next layer, that lighter layer. And then we, once that's dry, we're ready to add our highlights. So while it's really hard to see in this picture on the right, it does actually have some gold highlights. Now when I first started credit card painting, so many people had told me how great it was. And when I jumped into it, I had the first two layers down and I was really disappointed. But what I found is that when you add that third layer, those gold highlights, it just really brings that background to life. So it's a great way to add colour and whether it's on cereal box cardboard, whether you do it straight onto ephemera sheets, whatever you choose, it's a great way to get that colour down and have a really good place to start. So then we sit our second background aside to dry and we're ready to move on to our third. And of course it wouldn't be a mixed media art.net tutorial without some found object painting. So again we want to choose a couple of colours of paint, a light green, a dark green and gold is a really good place to start. Then grab some of the objects that you've already got around you and I hope you've been collecting them, we've been talking about this for long enough. Make sure you've got some bubble wrap, a jar lid, some sponges, a cork and here I've even managed to pull out an old toothbrush which is so much fun for splattering paint around. You might remember doing that in kindergarten and guess what it's just as fun as an adult. So what we want to do is start making impressions so I've put a little bit of paint onto that paint palette which in this case is just an old meat tray and then use the paintbrush to add the paint onto the bubble wrap and the objects and again one colour is boring so we want to use it to mix it go from the light green to a medium green down to a dark green. Move your, pass, your cardboard around so that you have the impression at different angles and try not to make a pattern, try to keep it really random. Continue with your different shapes, your different colours to fill it up. Again the great thing about this is it tends to dry fairly quickly so you can move through and, and get quite a bit of area covered as the paint goes. If you run out of paint then simply add a little bit more. Make sure you add those gold highlights as you come along as well. So once we finish that background, we can set that aside to dry as well. So that's the end of our first step, creating the base backgrounds. So you can see there on the left, our jelly plate printing background. The one in the middle is our found object printing. And the one on the right is our credit card painting. Now you can see the one in the middle still has a little bit of the background going through. So I did go back and add a little bit of more paint into that. It quite often works well when you're doing found object painting and printings to do all that first and then when you've got just a little bit of paint left on your palette, really water that down and then spread that out. Of course the challenge is you don't want it too thin because otherwise it, it looks a bit bubbly. But again, that's fine. You can then add a few different layers and then leave that to dry. So once we've got our backgrounds finished and they're all dry, we can then move on to step two. So now we get to embellish the backgrounds, add some colours and have a bit of fun. So you can see here with the colours I've chosen, I've definitely had the holiday season, both Thanksgiving and Christmas on my mind. So they were the colours that I chose. When you look at the colours to choose for this second level, we want something that's a little bit more of a contrast. So looking at the complementary colours. So here we've looked at the reds to go with the greens and then the oranges and yellows to complement them as well. So on our jelly plate backgrounds, we decided to do some more painting. So I've used a couple of colours of red. I started off stenciling with that sequin scrap. So using a really dry paintbrush, putting the paint onto the palette and then carefully stencil stenciling it or dabbing it through. Now I found that once I had that and all the red spots on, it didn't quite give me the effect I wanted. So I realised that we actually needed to add a shape as well to, to add to the interest, to balance it out a little bit. So then I used my favourite stencil. This is a Making Memories foam stencil set. So applying the paint with the paintbrush and then using it and turning it around all different ways, different sizes and angles. So you can see there I've done the first stamp and then the ghost print as well. So it's a great way to make sure you're using up all that paint. And then if there's any spaces in between, you can go back and add some more stenciling into it. So 
So for a credit card background, I decided to do some stenciling. Hopefully you're starting to get a collection of stencils as well. Now while I used bought ones, there's certainly no reason why you couldn't cut your own stencils. Sometimes that can be more of a challenge than others, so it's completely up to you as to which way you want to jump. Now my original plan was to actually do more partial stencils and do a few layers, but once I had this stencil out and then I'd sprayed it with some ink that I'd put into a spray bottle, as well as some glimmer mist, I really liked the outcome so I didn't do anything further with it. I did find however that the ink and the glimmer mist took a little bit to dry on the acrylic paint so I needed to sit that aside overnight to make sure it was well and truly dry before we moved on to the next step. So even though you can still see some of the blue of the cereal box underneath, it really doesn't stand out <coughs> Excuse me, because it's nice and bright in a contrast. And so for our found object background, <coughs> we're going to do some stamping on it. So I decided to jump into some Thanksgiving colours here. Use some orange and some yellow, and again those Making Memories foam stamps. So by putting the paint onto the palette and then using the paintbrush to apply the paint to the stamp, you can see on the right hand side there that you can just choose different areas of that stamp to add the colour. And it's okay if it blends a little bit on the edges because that's the effect we're going for. As you put the stamp down onto the background, make sure you rotate it in the different spots and move it around. So if, even if you're stamping a grid, don't just start from the left and work across to the right. Have an idea of the picture in your mind and then move it around. Then add some more paint and move it around again. That then stops it from becoming too uniform. One of the real challenges with creating these backgrounds is that while we try and do it quite randomly, we actually tend to create patterns and that makes it look a little bit too cut and paste or cookie cutter. So turn it around, turn the cardboard around, add some different colours. Then if it's getting too muddy, refresh your paint palette, start again. So now we've finished embellishing our backgrounds. So we added some stenciling and some foam stamping onto our credit, our jelly plate background. We added some more foam stamping onto our found object background. And then we added some stenciling onto the background for the credit cards. So now we're ready to get up to the really fun part, cutting it to size and decorating them. So here you can see what we're up to for the final embellishments. We'll step through these parts as well. So the first thing was to cut them to postcard size, so six inches by four inches. Now again if you decide that you wanted to make bookmarks or something else with them, cut them to whatever size you want. If you wanted to use them as journal covers, again cut them to that size that will then fit your pages and your binding equipment. So the size of my cardboard allowed me to fit four pieces into each one. And it was a little bit hard to fit them into my paper trimmer, but by trimming the edge, the short edge first, that then gave me a reference point. I could then turn them around and then cut them into strips and then cut them in half into the final six inches by four inches. Then go crazy, gather up all your materials, pull out your stamps, pull out your ink pads, pull out your paint pens. Whatever you'd like to put onto your cards to finish them off, they're the things that we want to grab out. I really like using the stays on and the brilliant inks because I know that they'll dry on any surface. Now why would I use one over the other? I tend to like the brilliant ink pads when we're doing something like this because they're a bit juicier, they've got more ink on them and it tends to give us a better impression. While the stays on is fantastic because it really does dry on any surface, it's quite a dry ink pad and doesn't always give us that, that juicier stamping outline. And particularly my stays on at the moment is a little bit dry, so it's not my favourite ink pad. What I also did before I jumped in and ruined my postcards was actually to do some testing of the markers and the inks. So with the strips that I cut off the edge, lined them up and then just put the inks on and the markers to see what it would look like. To check that it would dry on each of the surfaces and also to see what reflections and what it tied in with with the background. I wouldn't usually run a test, but I thought I'd better do it on this occasion, just to make sure that everything was going to work according to plan. So our very first set, we did some stamping onto jelly plate backgrounds. I used that wish you were wishing you a Merry Christmas stamp and stamped it in that Brilliance Lightning, Lightning Black ink pad. 
Now, I know it's really hard to see in the picture and it's actually really hard to see it in real life as well. It didn't come up as clearly as I was hoping. But as this is mixed media art and, of course, we were running out of time, I left it like this. I could have overstamped it and then embossed it in the gold. I could have done a series of things with it, but I find trying to overstamp is always a bit ambitious. So even if your first stamp isn't as good as you'd like, the more you try and fix it, the worse it tends to get. So I just had to leave it like that. So on these first four cards, I stamped, we wish you a Merry Christmas, and then I edged them in the black and in the gold, and then set those aside to dry. For the next lot of jelly plate backgrounds, I actually did some gold embossing. Now, for those of you that started along the mixed media art path from stamping, I'm sure one of the things that you fell in love with was that embossing powders, and it was actually really fun to get them out again and to see that gold powder turn into a beautiful stamped image. So to do this, I used a rubber stamp with Versamark, so that's the ink that's nice and clear and is really nice and sticky, and then added the gold embossing powder on, knocked off all the excess, and then heat set that with a heat gum, which then makes it bubble up and look like that. So I was really happy with those because it gave a nice impression. It really does stand out from the background and it tied in really nicely with the gold borders. I did edge a couple of these in black as well, but I really think I prefer the gold ones. That sort of ties those main colours together. For the stenciled backgrounds, I decided I didn't want to add too much extra, so I used that stamped it. The stenciled image to its best effect and figured out how to cut the postcards around that. However, when I stamped on them with the Versamark and the gold embossing ink, the ink on the stenciling wasn't quite dry and I ended up with little spots of gold embossing powder all over the place. I'm not sure if you can see it, but that season's greetings really didn't stamp clearly and I was quite frustrated with it. I did my best to knock off that extra ink, but of course once you heat set it, it stuck. So again, lessons learned, if you're going to use gold embossing, you might want to consider not using ink or even perhaps using a cornflower base to get rid of all the static. Or if you're not that worried, and again, it's mixed media art, so anything goes. But if you wanted a really crisp image, this probably isn't the best method to do it. So I applied the season's greeting stamp to all four postcards, added on the gold embossing powder, and then edged those with the gold marker. And so for our final background, I wanted to add a Thanksgiving theme. And I'm very ashamed to say I don't actually have any Thanksgiving stamps. Being here in Australia and we don't tend to celebrate Thanksgiving, we're already right in the throes of Christmas. So I decided to just use my own handwriting and add a sentiment that matched. Firstly, I practiced on the offcut just to make sure that the marker would dry and also to make sure that I had the space to write it because I was approaching the corner and then making sure that if I went slowly that it would come out nicely. Find particularly with paint markers if you write too quickly it becomes a bit streaky and a bit see-through and then of course we're tempted to touch it up and tend to make a mess so if you just go nice and slow and steady a lot slower than you would normally write then it tends to come up really well and again this needed to be heat set it took quite a while to dry on that background being a paint pen. And then we edge those in black to tie the sentiment and the edges together. So now it was time to seal them with varnish. And after gesso, I'd certainly suggest the second thing that you need is some spray varnish. It just makes it so much easier to seal anything that you've created. You're not worrying about smudging it with those brush strokes. I like to line all mine up on some pieces of card or some core flute that have been covered with our cereal box plastic. That then allows us to capture some of the overspray and it makes it easier to move them around as well. I'm not trying to juggle 16 individual postcards. I can move them into big, in big sections. Please make sure you use this stuff outside. It tends to go everywhere and it does smell quite strongly. So hopefully you've got an area where you can move them outside if it's not too windy and the sun's out. Gives them a really good spray. When you've got that first coat down, Get down and have a really close look at them. Get that light reflecting off it so you can see you've got a nice even coat of varnish and then let it sit outside for a little while so that the fumes can start evaporating. At this point, as tempting as it is to touch them and see if they're dry, please leave it for a few hours. There's nothing worse than ruining a beautiful finish on varnish when you wanted to give it a poke or a prod. 
So that's again a great thing about having the backing piece is that we can then move them around without touching them. So once that spray varnish is dry, we can then turn them over and finish off the back of the postcards. So here I've used a Darkroom Doors limited edition stamp to stamp at the top. And then with a black gel pen and a ruler, I've just added some lines to the postcard. So one down the middle to split it into those two sections. And then I've added five lines at equal distances so I can add the addresses on so I can send these out to you for those lucky ones that have won their own postcards. So there are my sample of my three main postcards. Just wondering if any of you got any questions. Again, you're welcome to type them into that question box and then we'll run through them and get as many as we can answer in the next few minutes. So I've got a question here about the paint pens. So these have only just recently become available in Australia and the ones I used were the Pentel medium bullet points and they were available from Officeworks. So from those of you that are in Australia, we can now get them ourselves, which is really exciting. So I use the gold, the black, and I've also got the white, which is quite exciting. How did I get such a crisp border, Carolyn asked. Well, to do the edging, and sorry, I forgot to mention that, the way that I hold them is to put the postcard onto a scrap piece of paper, make sure that the ink's coming really well through the paint pen, and then putting it on and using the edge of the postcard as the ruler. So not adding an extra ruler because that tends to smudge if the marker get paint gets under it, and then pulling it towards us, then letting it sit there for a little bit to dry, before we turn it around again as well. So it's a little bit time consuming, but I like to do it slow and steady. Now, for some reason you do slip. And if you can see on that middle postcard there, the thankful one, the top right hand corner has got a few little squiggles. I actually did slip as I was trying to create that border. So I've just turned it into a little squiggle and I'm sure no one's going to notice. So it does take a little bit of practice to get the pressure right between applying it sideways and applying it down. And what I might actually do is create a tutorial on how I do that edging as well. Not always the best for your paint pen, so you might want a set for edging and a set for writing as well. Now Diana's asked about the stencil. So that round stencil is a crafter's workshop, a Belzar Designs, and it's actually the Mayan calendar one. TCW321 and I'll put those details on the website later today as well so if you're after it. I think it's a great one because it's nice and round and has a few different interesting shapes in it. Wendy's asked whether I used matte or gloss varnish. I like to use the gloss varnish. Again when you put that gloss on there's something about it it just seems to really consolidate the layers and to really bring your artwork to life. If you're not sure whether you want glass gloss or matte, I'd certainly suggest that you try the gloss first and if you're not happy with it, try and use a matte one as well. It's also worth testing the varnish. I didn't test it very well in this case and some of the paint did actually, not so much smudge, but I think it was reactivated. So I needed to be really careful to let them sit and dry so that it wouldn't um, smudge or make a further mess. And Carolyn's just bought some paint pens, so fantastic. Please go out and use them and have fun with them but make sure you do use them in a well-ventilated area. I had a little bit of a headache by the time I'd finished making these postcards last week. Carolyn's also asking where I got the spray varnish from. I did actually buy them from an art supply store. I know there's sometimes that people will point out and say that maybe you can use some hairspray to seal it, and I really wouldn't suggest that. If you want to take care of your art and look after it and share it with others, I suggest that you do spend the money on, like I said, just a couple of key things. One of them is decent gesso and the other one is a decent spray varnish and other than that you're welcome to use whatever you want. So the other question was about the foam stamps so unfortunately this making memory set is no longer available so I will put a link up to it and if you happen to see it secondhand on eBay or if you've already got a set then hold on to it because it's my absolute favorite and they're no longer selling them. Okay, so Anna Powell's asked about the spray ink. What I did have was the ink that I'm about to write a review on and I put that straight into the spray bottle. I'll put a link up and onto the website with exactly which ink that I've used. I haven't got it at hand. But luckily it was thin enough 
to put straight into the spray bottle. My first trial, I did add it with water and it was an absolute watery disaster. So the ink was actually thin enough to put straight into the spray bottle. And Linda asked, what happens if you don't have cereal boxes? What can you use for a base? So certainly any thick card, whether it's um, basil card stock or some normal chipboard, um, I probably wouldn't use any um, sort of advertising material that's really not thick enough for cereal boxes. So if you don't have cereal boxes, I guess you could use any other boxes that you've got. Pasta boxes or muesli boxes, muesli bar boxes. Hmm. You could always use, recycle other gift cards and use it to um, use the gesso to cover up the writing or to cover up the picture that's already there. Or of course, there's no reason why you couldn't upcycle some of your previous gift cards and really just add some embellishments to what you've already got. So hopefully you'll always be able to find some cardboard. Oh, Linda, if you're really desperate for cereal boxes, we'll see what we can work out because I've got enough here to supply all of us. Okay, so now let's get into that birthday fun and then we can go and start playing ourselves. So I have 16 gorgeous postcards here that I would love to share with all of you. So for your chance to win one of them, pop over to mixmediaart.net slash birthday fun. And if you don't have a chance to get that email, that website down now, it'll be out in the email that's sent to you. And Carolyn's also told me that she gets some great cardboard from Costco between layers of canned goods. What a fantastic idea. So yeah, anywhere that you can find cardboard, give it a go. And again, try it. Don't put a lot of effort into it, but do some experiments and see what you can get out of it. So for your very own copy of your postcard, pop over to mixmediaart.net slash birthday fun and leave me a comment. Tell me about your journey of mixed media art over the last four years. What have you experimented with? What have you learned? What sort of things have you created? What are you doing now that you didn't think you could do a few years ago? I've even managed to get some of my artwork hung up on a, the wall of my house. And again, the thought of that a couple of years ago was just way too scary. I wasn't ready to share my artwork with the world. But we've just got to put ourselves out there. Who have you met through this wonderful community? What classes have you taken? I want to hear all about it. So pop over to mixmediaart.net slash birthday fun. And the entries for that will close on Sunday the 1st of December. And then I'll have to get busy and get them out before the holiday mail gets too busy. The other thing we also want to do is to make your own postcards. Now, if you've got a blog, please add photos there and then come back and link them to that same page, that birthday fun page. And then what we also want to do is find ways to share them. So if you've made a few postcards that you'd like to share, send me an email at createmixmediaart at gmail.com and we'll find a way of getting some addresses and sharing them with each other. It's such a great way to have a look at art in real life and to really get a different feel for it than you would just seeing photos online. So if you need more inspiration now and it's not too late at night or too early in the morning and you've got to head off to work, there's a few places that you can visit. Of course, we've got our Mixed Media Art Technique Sheets, those 10 projects that cover all sorts of basic techniques right through to creating shrines, easily bound books and post-it note covers. So you can pop over to mixmediaart.net slash postcard tute underscore M-M-A-T-S and find that whole set of bundles there that's ready for immediate download so you can have them there to experiment for the rest of the day. If you don't want to buy the entire bundle, you can pop over to MMATIND Individuals and that will allow you to purchase just a single one. So if you'd like more information on credit card painting, on creating a simple bound book or even using tissue paper as part of your background, then that's the place to be. And of course, we've got our Creating Layers and Mixed Media Art book. So if you enjoyed this tutorial and you want to get a little bit more in depth, that book steps you through a series of techniques that you can use in all sorts of orders. It also gives you a suggestion of the way to put them together. And then it completely goes through two projects. One's creating an uh, altered book or an art journal background. And the second one is actually creating a canvas.
And one of the key features of that book that I really like is a what next tutorial. How often do we find that we sit down to put these layers together and just think, oh, what does it need next? Does it need some more layering? Does it need some words? And this gives you an idea of the tools that you've already got out and how you can put them together to create some other artwork. And Carolyn's asked, will the recording be available? It certainly will be. And I'm hoping to have them up on the website later today and early tomorrow. So there'll be an email out in the next couple of days letting everyone know where those tutorials are. And the videos for actually showing the techniques will be released over the next few days as well. So thank you for spending your time with me today. I hopefully that you've inspired you to help set your imagination on fire. How can we use these techniques, like we said, to get started, to use the things that we've already got? Wendy, hopefully you can see the email address there on the screen. So it's createmixedmediaart at gmail.com. So today we've talked about postcards. We've talked about cereal box cardboard. There's absolutely no reason why we couldn't use this to create greeting cards, to create decorations, to create gifts for the holiday season. We can turn it into bookmarks. We can turn it into altered trading cards. And again, I've stepped through three very distinct backgrounds and different approaches. There's absolutely no reason why you couldn't add a layer of paint with a credit card, do some found object stamping, and then add some highlights with your jelly plates. What I wanted to do is just keep them nice and simple so you can see how those layers build up, and then you can turn them into whatever you'd like to make them. So thank you so much for joining us today and happy creating. Mm -hmm.